Welcome to the CLS Education STEM Seminar Series. You are connecting to Canada's only synchrotron research facility, which is situated in the middle-ish of Treaty 6 territory and traditional homeland of the Métis, known as Saskatoon. We would like to acknowledge that most of our education programs are funded at least in part through NSERC Promo Science and that their flexibility has enabled us to develop ways um, to connect online and create more virtual programs like this series. My name is Tracy Walker and I am the education programs lead. And with me today and helping to moderate this is Anna Maria Beckler and Amanda Pfeiffer. Before we get started, I would like to discuss a couple of logistical tips um, for this online environment. Um, first, we are recording this so that those people who are unable to join us now can still engage with us later. If you prefer to keep your camera off for that reason, then um, please feel free to use the chat function. There are a couple of different viewing arrangements that you might prefer. You can adjust the setting by clicking on the three little dots uh, in the lower right corner. I recommend the grid or the sidebar view if you want to be able to see the presenter alongside the PowerPoint. I remind you to please keep your microphones on mute when you're not actually trying to talk to us um, so that we can keep background noise to a minimum. Uh, and finally, questions are welcomed throughout the presentation please indicate that you have a question in the chat and one of the moderators will um, interject for you. Um, time for questions and discussions at the end, if you wish. So without further ado, I'm super excited to introduce to you Joe Muse. He's a teacher in Burnaby, BC. This year, he was awarded the uh, American NSTA, National Science Teaching Association, Exemplary Teaching Award recognizing excellence and innovation in science teaching. He's connected with CLS a couple of times through our Students on the Beamlines uh, program, as well as with some PD opportunities. Uh, welcome, and thank you very much for agreeing to talk to us today, Joel. Thank you, Tracy. Um, so we're gonna to talk today about how the CLS education programs have really affected my teaching. Um, and my views of science and really how science is viewed in my school. Um, uh, there we go. So before I went into teaching, um, I actually had a background in research and my undergraduate degree, I worked in a, a lab that ran the biggest laser on the east coast of Canada at the time in a physics lab. Um, and I worked in a biology lab where I looked at mechanical properties of lobster arteries. Um, and so on the left side picture, my students love when I put this slide up because it shows that I once had hair and they're very entertained by that. Um, and then when I moved to the, to the West Coast, um, I worked with an ecotourism company and we were looking at heart rate tagging, um, heart rate monitoring, monitoring tags on gray whales. That's me on the, on the front of that, of that fishing boat. Um, and the point of this is that when I started teaching um, and I started talking to students about um, what they can do if they go on in science, I really focused on research as a possible career. Um, a lot, lots of good science students automatically have the idea that they're going to go into medicine um, and engineering, and I wanted to talk about research science as, a, as an opportunity for them, um, which is one of why when I discovered the Light Sources Education programs, um, particularly students on the beam line, I got really excited because here's a chance to get students doing really high-level research. Um, a little bit of my history of teaching before I got to the light source. Um, I started teaching in 2005, and I'm a person who operates best when I'm busy. Um, and so as a starting teacher, I was busy, automatically busy all the time. And it was, you know, it was chaotic. It was the really busy years of my teaching, but it was, it was also really fun. Um, started calming down a little bit, but I decided to make my life busy again by starting coaching. So I started an ultimate frisbee team at my school and I've been running it ever since. Um, I eventually got more settled in the teaching. I got used to my the processes of being in the classroom and how um, and how to manage my time. And then I started thinking again, I'm not busy enough. So I started looking for more things. Um, and I started a master's program um, through, the Mon through Montana State University. And it was mostly online, but at the tail part, I had to go down to present my capstone research um, 
physically in Montana. And while I was in Montana, I had lots of free time. So I was sitting around one evening looking for professional development opportunities in Canada. Um, this was going to Montana was a chance to really get immersed in some, you know, teachers talking about their teaching uh, in a different way. And so when I finished my master's program, is it was around the same time that I discovered the CLS education programs. Um, and I, while I was in Montana, sent up, submitted an application, not knowing what, what was going to happen with it, but just thinking that it might be a cool opportunity. Later that fall, um, I heard back from Tracy that I had been accepted into the, into the program. And then I had to start thinking about what, what is a synchrotron? What does it do? Um, as a physics teacher, I had some experience, um, primarily through our local facility um, in Vancouver, which is Triumph. Triumph is a cyclotron as opposed to a synchrotron. Um, but I had an, an idea of how it worked. Um, but I didn't really understand fully how the, the light source was being used yet, because I was thinking about a a, a cyclotron rather as a um, a beam source for doing medical isotopes, and then of course I knew about the Large Hadron Collider as a synchrotron. So my initial thought was as a physics teacher that I'd be going and seeing a collider um, until I started doing a bit more research. Um, And so I went to first went to Saskatoon in December of 2015. Um, I've put up the the more up to date picture from the front page of the teacher workshop. Uh, it's virtual now for anyone that's following along and is looking for some great uh, professional development. Um, it was there, and so the workshop was very interesting to me because it really provided an opportunity to get and really see the science going on. Um, I've been to lots of great professional development. I kind of think about four uh, real pillars of what I consider good professional development. And one of them is a great science facility and being able to see real science going on. And that's definitely evident at the CLS Teachers Workshop. Um, the second one is providing great presentations and interaction with scientists that are doing the work. Again, CLS, check that box. Um, Third one is giving teachers hands-on uh, materials that they can use in their classroom, but also hands-on science they can do while they're there. Another check mark. And then lastly, um, the ability to promote social interaction with the teachers, teachers getting to know each other and creating a network of people that they can work with um, beyond their own community is very important. Again, the teacher workshop did that in spades. Um, and so it was interesting because, you know, we all had our cell phones out the entire time and everyone was taking pictures uh, of every single part of the of the facility as we came along. Um, it was entertaining just taking pictures of people taking pictures at times. Um, but it was also a, a chance where we got to be hands on, mount samples, run samples, um, which is something that I had never really had the opportunity to do before in that in that same way. And so at the end of this, I came back to, to British Columbia and I was, first thing I did on Monday morning was talk to my school principal about the fact that I can bring students there by, you know, if we apply and get accepted and, you know, can I do it? And he, he thought about it and pretty instantly said, yes, let's get going on this and said, do what you need to do. And away I went starting to work on our, our first application. Um, to give an idea of timing, we applied in April of 2016. We heard back in May, and then in June we had our beam time scheduled, and it was all systems go. And so our first student beam line group, it was seven students interested. It was, you know, I thought it would be a bit of a tough sell to get students interested. Well, I didn't think it would be a tough sell, but there was the idea that, you know, we're going to go to Saskatoon in the winter time, um, Whereas, you know, they could spend their money and go to Mexico with their family or something, you know, so it was hard to, you know, I was worried that I wouldn't have students that would be want to do it, but I had seven. Um, and so everybody that wanted to take part got to take part in that first that first go, uh, which was definitely not the case in future years after that. Um, and so they I started them working on this idea of what do you want to research when you go? And it was it's hard for students um, to come up with ideas at first because they're not used to being the one in the driver's seat of their science education. Um, and so they came up with some ideas, looking at water quality in local mountains, looking at pollution uh, in the major river near us, Fraser River, 
um, and then analysis of soil from our rainforests. Um, this ended up being a really difficult process for them to come up with ideas to start. And then the even more difficult process for them when they realized that these ideas probably might not work uh, in the context of the education programs and the beam line would have available. Um, in our first early meetings, we realized that water is tested by every level of organization, government you can think of. So not necessarily the most interesting topic. Same with pollution that is probably well studied. Um, and we thought then this is from the suggestion of the education um, team at CLS that soil is something that the CLS is good at. Um, and they haven't had a lot of West Coast soil, so maybe we should focus on that as our idea. So they eventually um, focused on looking at composition of Okanagan's soil from the Okanagan, um, along with grapes and wine. Um, along the way, the students really wanted to focus on something that was topical to British Columbia. Um, and they thought it would be interesting if they can find a piece that was of economic interest. Um, and the wine industry and the tourism industry in the Okanagan um, is significant, so they ended up settling there. Um, but really, this was the hardest part of our project was getting started and figuring out what we wanted to, what they wanted to work on. And so, for those first few months, it was an awful lot of um, video conferencing. Uh, it was Skype back then. I don't know we use Skype anymore, though. Um, so, with Rob and Anna Maria, with wineries in the Okanagan, we found some people that were very willing to, to uh, have conversations with us and. Katie O'Kell from Serendipity Winery was actually a science background, now working um, in a vineyard and using science to manage her, her crops. And she was very excited to, to work with the team. Uh, we video conference with alumni. Uh, this is a, a former student of mine who works at Tesla building battery systems. Um, just to get the students an exposure to people doing science in other fields and how excited he was really impacted these students. Um, and then we also reached out to local researchers. So this was um, a professor at UBC who does wine research, who was willing to talk about uh, the winemaking process and how it may impact what we're looking for in our study. Uh, but the moral of that was, if you're going to do this, students in the Beamline program, you get used to Skype or Zoom or Google Meet calls. Um, at the time, it was a novel thing. Uh, in our current situation, it's not a novel thing anymore, but it was, it was a bit of a big deal at the time. And so after this, students really were focusing on how do we get samples, um, where do we get our samples from, and how is that going to work? And so the students got set out and started emailing every vineyard they could find in the Okanagan. Um, they CC me on all of the emails, so I was you know daily inundated with piles of emails. And they emailed 45 and agreed to participate with seven. Originally, we didn't get a lot of responses from them, and we were worried about samples. So I started following up and saying, hey, my students emailed you. Might you be interested? And we got a lot of replies back that said, yeah, we didn't answer because we're not going to give wine to a bunch of 17-year-olds. Um, and so then once they saw that I was involved, they were more willing, um, and they realized that it was actually an official school project, and it was um, we came to some ideas of how they could, how they could um, provide us with materials. And so we planned a road trip. Um, the Okanagan is a five hour drive away. We did it, we wanted to do it before the snow uh, came on the Coquihalla Highway. Um, and it was really a great day of getting to know my students. We decided to drive up and back in one day, collect a bunch of samples. Um, it was a good bonding experience for, for all of us. And so when I talked to students about um, the experiences with this program, um, a lot of it is about soft skills. Um, being able to do a presentation, being able to handle stress, being able to organize your materials. But there were also other skills that they learned along the way. Um, this group of boys on the left side photo here had never really dug a hole. And so there was a, a vineyard nearby, um, in, nearby us in, in our part of British Columbia that's actually run by a former student of our school. And he said, come on by and we'll, we'll get you guys started. That way you can get some context for what you do later on. And he's like, okay, guys, dig a hole. And they they were they were floundering at first until he said, okay, do this, do this. And he got them really working on digging a hole. He told them to dig two feet down. They didn't need to dig two feet down, but he wanted them to just get some experience um, at at this. Um, but it really was um, a great bit of field experience for the students, which is what I was hoping for this, is getting that idea of getting out in the field, collecting samples, being able to organize your samples, um, 
as you went along. And so our, these are from our day that we went to the Okanagan collecting samples and students really got out there um, and got to see various parts of the winemaking process with people that were excited to share their knowledge with, with our students, which is cool seeing how um, the wider community is willing to engage with students that are excited about things that are going on. Um, and really all you have to do is ask. Um, you don't know until you ask has kind of been my philosophy with a lot of this stuff. Um, and sending out lots of emails, getting lots of not replies, but the ones that do reply tend to be excited to help. And so we've, um, along the way, I got an email um, on November 26th. Sorry, our beam line was scheduled for November 26th, but we got some worrying news on November 15th that there was a, an issue with the, the vacuum um, at the, of the synchrotron and that our beam time was in danger, which was obviously very concerning. Um, and so all of my students and I started checking on the, the status screen daily. Um, and that's November 14th, the day um, before we got the worrying news. Um, but fortunately for us, the Thursday it started turning back on. And then this is during our actual beam time on the November 26th. I think it was the first morning that it came back up was when our beam time was scheduled. So we were very happy um, because it was trying to scramble up alternate plans was what we were looking at at the time. We were very fortunate that we were able to actually get our beam time. Um, and so we traveled to Saskatoon. Um, the students came in the day before and got everything organized. We had a mixture of having to check samples. We couldn't bring, obviously, bring the wine samples with us um, on carry-ons. So they went checked, but we could bring some grapes and some soil samples. Interesting conversations at customs, why we're bringing soil samples through, you know, on the airplane. Um, but we we traveled and it was, it was, it was fairly smooth. Um, and then once we got there, the students were blown away. Um, I still remember the first time that I walked into the front doors and saw the, the facility. And really for the students, it was the same process. Cameras out, taking pictures all the way along. Um, and they were kind of in awe at first of, the, of what they were seeing. Um, but then they got to work and they started getting their samples ready. And they got a tour uh, with Rob. And he was very excited to show them the facility. Um, and they really realized the, the amount of work they're going to have to do over the next number of days. And it was really interesting to watch them uh, mentally prepare themselves for the, the parts that were, were to come. Um, and so we had our day on the, on the beam line where the students collected in their data. And they, it was interesting to watch because it was a mixture of working really hard when you had to get samples mounted and stuff. But for them, they found it tiring also because there's a lot of waiting around. And they didn't think that was what the process was. Um, and it was interesting getting their feedback that sort of that afternoon or that evening of it was exciting, but it was also tiring. Um, but then what's next? And so they, we, got, we went out to dinner and came back and they realized that they still had a lot of data analysis to do. So they put an extra six hours in that evening um, just because they thought it would make their life easier the next day when they had to build through their presentation. Um, and so on the third day in Saskatoon, um, came what was probably the hardest day for the students. Um, they had to build a presentation that they would then present to um, CLS scientists and, and staff uh, on, their, on their last day. And they had made presentations for classes before, but they I don't think part of the, what the students had experienced was getting real feedback on a presentation in advance of doing it. And so they spent the morning getting a presentation started and by early afternoon, they thought that they were ready to go. And so we presented um, to Rob and Anna Maria and my, Tracy and myself, and their presentation really got ripped up. Ripped up. Um, there was so much feedback, so much uh, notes that I had made for them and that everybody else had made for them. They kind of were shell-shocked afterwards, um, but they said, okay, let's, let's do it again. And so they rebuilt the presentation. And then three hours later, they did another run through um, and there was less tearing up on the next run, but there was still a lot of feedback of things that had to get fixed. Um, and it was interesting because it ended up being a 16 hour day. We started, I think at eight in the morning, we were there past midnight. Um, I still remember the kids are working in the room. I came out just looking out over the, the, the facility itself. Um, and the fact that we were allowed to be there, very few people in the building anymore. Um, and they're still working really hard uh, to get themselves ready to present the next day. Uh, and then one of my, probably one of my proudest moments as a teacher is seeing my students up there uh, presenting, taking control of a room of 
um, of professional scientists uh, and talking about the work that they had done and the, how proud they were of it. Um, and so this is sort of typical of the data that they collected um, in that first run. Um, they were looking at soil, grape and wine samples and the chemical composition and how elements transferred uh, through, through the winemaking process. Um, it was interesting, this sample is actually from Vista Doro, which is the, the vineyard run by an alumnus um, near us. And he actually contacted me last year and said, hey, do you still have our analysis? We'd like to use it as we plan for our, um, our next soil treatment. And so we found the graph and sent it off to him and away he went. Um, he was very happy to get the data back. Um, when we returned to British Columbia, the students were very excited to share what they had experienced. Um, and they presented at a, at a full staff meeting. So now they were, instead of presenting to a group of scientists, they were presenting to all of the staff of our school that normally are up teaching them. And they were really, again, took control of the room, very proud of their work. And they said, what else can we do? So I contacted the BC Association of Physics Teachers. And in February 2017, uh, I presented about the my teacher perspectives of the program. And the students, again, got up in front of a room of 40 physics teachers um, and again, controlled the room. And it really was impressive to see and inspiring to see them um, so proud of their work. And for me, it was sort of empowering as a teacher because it was one of my first moments presenting uh, to other teachers. Uh, and I kind of said, this is pretty cool. Um, I want to do this more and I want to start looking for more ways that I could that I could do that. Um, so we moved on and decided again a couple of years. We had the, it was probably best to apply every two years just for my own energy and also constraints of the beam line. Um, and so the second time we had 38 students apply. We went from seven applying to 38 applying. Um, and, and so it was all of a sudden I have to make a selection um, and getting other teachers involved um, to help me pick students because I don't know all the students at my school all the time. Um, and this time they had a bit of better, better sense of narrowing in project ideas to start. Um, part of function of the students that were involved, but also having talked to their um, the older students that are, had already done this. So looking at old growth trees on Vancouver Island, uh, looking at plant life near pipelines or microplastics in BC waters. Again, not really having questions lined up yet, but the idea of topics that are a bit more narrow. Um, they eventually decided to look for chemical evidence of forest fires in trees that have survived a forest fire. Um, and this ended up being another really exciting project. Um, this time, there we go. Um, our sample procedure was a bit different. Uh, we started contacting forestry companies and they said, yeah, we're happy to give you samples, but no, you can't come collect them because we don't want high school students with chainsaws. Um, and so, but they were, they were great. We had, you know, three different days, these big Tupperwares, the 150 pounds of tree cookies showed up uh, at the school, they would ship them to us. They're really excited and happy to help us out. Uh, my tree smelled like Douglas fir for about six months. It was really a nice smell. Um, and it was interesting, the students, you know, they knew they needed really small samples, but all of a sudden they were getting these giant tree cookies. Um, and it was a question of what do we do with them? What do we do with them now? Um, and they realized, again, looking at soft skills, that one of the first things they're gonna have to do is sand. Um, and students did not, some, some of these students did not know a lot about sanding in terms of getting the down to the level smooth enough for analysis of the beam line, um, or even just for counting rings. And the point when we left, when we finished our, our sanding in BC, thought we were ready to go and got to Saskatoon and said, no, you actually have a whole lot more sanding to go, um, was interesting. I'm very much trying to let students drive the process. They came up with interesting ways to try to count samples that I had not thought of. Um, on the left side, they projected um, the, a video of the actual tree cookie up onto the screen so they could physically count it by marking tick marks on the on the on the on the big board um, that ended up being not so effective so they took um, a tablet on the right side digitally took a digital picture and then used ink to mark out all the rings and count them that way and so it's interesting for me just seeing the different ways that they approach problems um, and uh, use their creativity along the way 
helpful for us again was reaching out to people that were professionals in the field. Um, an alumnus of our school, uh, Nikki Kranitz, who's doing a PhD at UBC in, in forestry, was very excited to come back and help us out and give uh, a talk to the students about tree physiology um, and how our project might relate to that. Um, he also suggested to the students that they check out a tool called IMAP BC. Uh, the government has a database of every forest fire that's ever happened in, in the province well, in the last hundred years. And so they could look at their trees and if they have the location, they can go and look up when the historical forest fires were. Um, so they could try to find um, where forest fires might have occurred um, to where, when, when they should be looked for in the, in the, in the tree rings. And again, pray for Beamline 2.0. Um, in the run up to this other, the this, this second run, we had actually had beam time scheduled for December, um, but over the course of the summer, there was a series of events that happened, uh, starting with a broken electron gun, which resulted in our beam time being canceled. And then as the preparations came to restart again uh, in January, there was more problems along the way. Um, and so again, we were faced with this idea that it's uncertain that we're actually gonna have beam time and able, and able to do our experiment. Um, which again is an important learning part for students though, because in doing science, you are very much at the mercy of your equipment. And so this is really part of what, if what happens. Fortunately for us, again, the beam line was up and running. It actually did drop off for 25 minutes, half an hour of our, of our beam time, um, but we were able to get samples. So we were able to come in December originally, um, but because of the, the, the delays, we were coming in February. In British Columbia in February, uh, crocuses are normally coming up. And so this is an interesting thing for my students to prepare for because many of them had never really been to a, a cold, snowy condition uh, like this before. So I had interesting questions on the way up, you know, do I have to bring ski goggles? Should I bring like three pairs of snow pants? Um, and I'm like, no, it's a 10 minute walk. We'll be, you know, it'll be fine. Um, but it was also, they, the kids really enjoyed it. They were up in the morning with their uh, cup of boiling water and then throwing it in the air and watching it turn to mist, uh, things you don't get to experience uh, in our part of the West Coast. Um, and one of the really cool things that they got really excited about is we went out a couple of the evenings looking for northern lights if we could find them. Uh, and we found ice pillars uh, looking from Ogle Hall out um, over the river, um, which really sort of made another cool experience as part of this already cool science experience. And so once again, students were very excited uh, to be at the, at the light source and getting tours um, of, the, of the facilities. We spent time um, working in the Mystic Ascawan Dendrochronology Lab, the Mad Lab. Um, our, one of our science advisors was Brooke, um, and she took the students over there because A, they hadn't sanded their samples to the level of where we could use them yet, but also the, the stuff at the Mad Lab, the, can't remember the name of it, but the device of the Mad Lab will be very useful for us for counting samples um, compared to what we were going to try to do um, at the light source. Thank you, Zach. Um, so this is a uh, more more um, of the students on, on the ideas beamline. Um, on the left bottom left picture, we actually had one of our students design uh, our sample holder. He's now in first year engineering and he wanted to see if I could, he could use his engineering skills to try to come up with something and he machined a metal machine piece so he could slide in um, our tree cookie slices, uh, lock them in and run the experiments. Again, stuff that I hadn't thought would be part of this project, but students that have their interests and they're able to run with it a little bit and apply it. So this is typical of the data from the 2019 edition. Um, they looked at elements that are prevalent in forest fire ash, uh, and this was now running the, the, along the length of a sample from the center out, and they knew the years that forest fires occurred so they could figure out where in the tree rings that would occur. Um, and so the 19, there's, here, there's a fire in 1930, and then a, some peaks in those elements um, immediately after, which they could look as a correlation between the forest with the forest fire. Um, and so I'm in the middle now of my third uh, students on the beamline round. Um, we have 11 students working on the project out of 25 that applied. It's stayed popular. Um, 
again, kind of getting a bit clearer on their ideas of what they want to look at. Uh, chemical indicators of red tide, uh, looking at BC salmon, uh, and they eventually focused on looking at beeswax. Um, and so this was something that they decided on, and they started working again with the education team at how to how we can take this and look at it. However, um, we have another situation where we don't we have uncertainty in our beam in our in our in our beam time. Uh, I'm sure other groups have had smoother processes with this. Um, but it's a case where we don't know, we're just scheduled to go in September. That's obviously been pushed back. So now we're just waiting to see, to see what happens. Um, so how these programs have affected me as a teacher, um, they've motivated me, to fi motivated me to find more ways to bring experiential learning uh, into my classroom and more ways to find students um, opportunities to connect with professional scientists. Um, from a purely teaching point of view, I use the light source schematics all the time when I talk about applications of electricity and magnetism, looking at how um, our electrostatic unit applies to our accelerating voltages, um, to the electron gun, and how we can use magnetism to talk about how we change um, the direction of an electron beam. And it's fun being able to drop Bremster lung radiation into my physics classes um, and how it's used. Uh, at the light source. Um, and along the way, I really wanted to use the light sources, our, our participation in, in Suits on the Beam Line, um, as a way of increasing the profile of science in our school. Um, our school has been, a long time, been a very strong athletic school, and it was more recently a, an excellent fine arts school. Um, but this provided a way to really promote science and students excited about science. Uh, to the broader community and let know let them know that things the cool things were going on. As part of that, again, people are excited to talk about students doing science. We contacted the Vancouver Sun, and we looked at their the guy who writes columns about wine, and he was willing to write an article about students uh, investigating the idea of terroir um, through the light source experiments. Um, Throughout all of the times that we've done this, we've made an effort to connect with alumni that are in science careers. And so we had a vineyard owner, we had somebody who's an architect at the Guggenheim Museum, um, somebody who works making adhesive tape at 3M, um, Nick Ukrainitz, who was our forestry uh, PhD student, um, and then perhaps most excitingly, a student who a former student who works at Tesla building battery systems. He happened to come back um, during one of our one of our times and brought a Tesla car over to take the kids for a drive. But part of the idea here is to connect students with people that have been through the process of their own school um, and that are excited to talk about their work and about um, about science and get inspired the kids in different ways. Um, so for me, then the experiential learning part is very valuable. Um, after the first experience, I knew I wanted to do more rounds of students on the beam lines if possible. Uh, more recently, I found the ESA CANSAT competition where students have to design and build a small probe um, that they launch in a rocket that collects data. Um, this was outside of my direct skill set, but I knew that I could find people that would help them if, if I could find the students that are willing. Um, and it's really finding non-regular classroom situations where kids can connect with science. Um, Worldwide Data Day is run by uh, CERN and some other organizations in QuarkNet, where CERN data is made available to students. They analyze it individually. They video conference with scientists and other students from around the world and talk about um, talk about the data and how, it's, how it works in science. And this is, again, coming from my Beamline experience of finding ways to connect students. Um, we've gone out to local tech companies and science companies to talk about what they're doing for tours, um, kind of in a similar vein. So one of my first students, uh, Daniel Alfonso on the left here, when he wanted to describe the product afterwards, he talked about it as being a science immersion um, experience. Uh, he likened it to, you know, if you want to learn how to speak French, you go to, you go to France and get yourself immersed in the culture. And so for him, the Beamline experience was very much, um, very much getting immersed in science and learning about it firsthand. Um, on the right side uh, is another one of my former students, Mackenzie Pereira. Uh, 
she used the CLS experiences in lots of her applications when she finished high school and going on to university. Um, and she was awarded the Luke Santi Medal from the Perimeter Institute, really on the strength of her how she talked about her experiences at the Light Source. And all of my students that have got graduated this year that went through the experience, they were telling me how a lot of their applications really heavily featured the, um, the students on the BMON as part of what they were talking about. Uh, this is the uh, CANSAT competition. Um, again, students really engaging in science in ways that are, that are different. Um, another takeaway for me is that there are companies that are really interested in, in helping people, uh, helping students engage in science. Um, emailing a second time pays off uh, in that, yes, with the wine when there was weird circumstances, but in general, if I email a company and don't hear back, I'll email them two weeks later and they'll say, oh yeah, I meant to get back to you and we'll help you out. Um, and so we've had really good success in terms of financial support, in terms of um, support, support with samples, um, other materials. Uh, these are all the ones that are that work with us for Beamline. It's been an even bigger, uh, a bigger list for our CANSAT work with uh, the Canadian aerospace industry. Um, and lastly then, the science is hard, um, but it's good for students to see that. Um, and so, you know, they put in super long nights um, and super long hours building presentations and doing work. The top right picture is a picture that Tracy took of me um, at the workshop in 2015, because um, by the end of it, my, I, I, was, I was saturated. I really couldn't think about a lot more than what was going on. Um, and then for me as a teacher, the CLS has really been the starting point for further ProD adventures. Um, which have really been a big part of what I do now is try to find cool experiences for me to go to that I can then bring my students to or ideas that I can bring back to my classroom. So I first went to the ESA Robotics um, workshop in 2018, which is where I found out about the CANSAT competition that I then brought students to. Um, also in 2018, I had the opportunity to go to LIGO, uh, the Laser Interferometer, Interferometer Gravitational Observatory in Hanford for their teacher workshop. Um, and that really has changed a lot of the modern physics I deal with in my class. Um, in a similar way, the Institute for Quantum Computing runs a workshop um, where they bring teachers in to talk about quantum mechanics, which is really not something covered in standard high school curriculum, um, but they give you ways to present it. And then perhaps my favorite experience was going to CERN in 2019 for two weeks. Um, as part of the International Teachers Work Week program, um, again, which I can trace back to my experiences at the CLS in 2015, um, getting me connected to this idea of this immersive professional development experience. And then one of the things that I said at the start about, you know, pillars of good professional development um, is building a network of teachers. So when I went to the CLS, there was maybe 20 of us um, from different parts of Canada. Um, and there's some connections that I made there that I, people that I, I interacted with afterwards. But then I went to the ESA workshops and then I, I, my list of people that I can connect with on ideas, ideas group. Um, and then I added LIGO and CERN. And now I have networks of people across the world that if I have an idea on teaching that I can say, hey, what do you think about this? Um, there are teachers that I work with that, from these programs where I'll make a lab, send it to them for feedback, they'll run it in their classroom, send it back to me, and you get a lot of international, international cooperation. It's, it's, it's kind of cool. And then lastly, a thanks to everybody um, at the CLS uh, who's helped us along the way, uh, and my, for, my students from all three groups. Uh, I've had very fortunate to have really good administrator support um, through all of my processes. And then thanks to my wife and kids who are okay with me going off on science adventures along the way. And that's it. Well, if we were in a room, we would be uh, applauding because that's the, the thank you cue says to do that, right? <laughs> that was really good. I enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, so wondering if there's a few questions that people would like to pose. Please feel free to unmute your mic and toss a question in there. Let 
And we have a bunch of shy people. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, in your opinion, what was the most difficult thing that your students had to overcome in, in their work? I think part of, a big one was having confidence in their own knowledge and ability. Um, we would have conversations, and this happens even with my, my current group, um, we'd have conversations with just us talking, um, and then we'd go on a Skype call with Tracy or Amanda yourself, um, and they, they freeze up, they don't talk. Um, and realizing that you know they actually have knowledge that they can share and questions they can ask is important to get them, them over that hump. Um, and again, when they come to the light source, when they work on their presentation, they present it very timidly, not as experts. They're like asking for approval as they present. Um, and you don't have to realize that this is you not you have the knowledge um, and you should take control of it and and own it. Yeah, nobody knows as much about their project as they do. Yeah. And how about for yourself? What was the most difficult thing that you had to overcome? I think for me, um, it's letting them take the reins and not trying to to shepherd them too much. Um, and the first one, I was a bit too hands on at, at times, and I eventually had to back myself off a little bit and let them run with it. Um, but realizing that, you know, let them make mistakes, let them figure it out, try to give them guidance um, to prevent some things, but that's part of the process as well. Okay, so I'm gonna leave some space here for others to pose a question. I'll ask one. Um, so with the forest fire project, it looked like arsenic peaked with all the other elements after the forest fire. Do you, like, did your students find out why? Um, uh, I don't remember, I don't have that answer to that question because um, <laughs> they were the ones that were running that and I didn't. Right. Um, yeah, I'm not certain on that one. Okay. I was just wondering. Yep. I can You'll ask have that to track. Yeah, track Brooke down and ask her. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> okay, so uh, I have another one. In your abstract, it says that, um, that interactions with uh, students on the beam lines and, and stuff like that really changed your teaching and who you are as a teacher. I'd like to revisit that for a minute. And yep. what do you feel changed? Because when you went through your timeline, you you talked about how you've always been busy. You've always wanted to, to work with your students and, and settling in. And you've always been trying to connect with science. So that that was there already. So what yeah, changed? And, I mean, there's obviously big projects like Beamline and um, the CanSat competition. Um, but those have limitations. It's hard to do that scale of science with all of my students all the time and so in my classroom teaching i went a lot of i've tried to move away from me as a center point to more student voice representation um, in terms of getting them to discover stuff in classroom settings um, on a scale different than than this obviously having them work in more cooperatively um, the science the team sport side of things um, where they can interact and Come, come to solutions on their own to complicated questions, uh, making that a focus instead of just me up at the front of the room talking all the time. Cool. Other? Okay, so what advice would you have for teachers that might be contemplating uh, getting involved with CLS or any other Research opportunity. Uh, I would say dive in. Um, I I am very much I dive into every opportunity that I can find and then figure out what I can what I can manage. Um, but there's a lot of people that are willing to help you along the way. Um, so find you know my philosophy is that if I find the opportunity, students will eventually find their way to it. Um, and so don't wait for students to ask you about stuff. Go out and find the opportunities and say, hey, this is out there. Let's go do it. Who wants to? Um, it's kind of a good way to do it. 
um, and that there's a lot of people that are companies, um, individual scientists that are very willing and interested to talk about what they do with students because they realize that may help you know them in the future with more scientists that are interested. Okay. Again, anybody else? Okay, opportunity for final remarks. Got it? Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to present here. I really uh, enjoyed thinking about this presentation and going back and revisiting my, my experiences with the Beam Line. And um, again, it's been really a great part of my teaching career to this point. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time and agreeing to present with us today. Um, I'm really glad that we did record this because I think that, um, you know, teachers that are new to the Students on the Beamlines program are contemplating it and not sure. I think this will be a really valuable resource for them to, to hear from a, a teacher what you went through and how you set it up and, and what the whole process was like for your students. I think that that'll be really valuable. So I thank you very much for that. Welcome.